three elementary schools as an equity and inclusion resource teacher. So I think I've got a few of my colleagues joining us and Kanita, I believe, is going to be sharing the screen. Yes, I'm about to go ahead and get started right now. Thank you. So um, myself, along with five other resource teachers, are here to be a support to classroom teachers, AICs, admin. Um, just know that we are here um, and welcome any kind of support and collaboration. If you need anything, please reach out. Are you ready for NTI, providing racial equity through content integration? Each of these um, presentations this week are going to follow one section of the R tool. So for the next five days, we will have a different section of the R tool um, in a lot more detail than it has been um, explained in the past. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So we're thinking about content integration for NTI. So if we go to the next slide, let's just look at a couple of objectives welcomes introductions and reminders. So um, I've got Kanita Ballard, who is also going to be on here. She works with um, Zone 3 elementary schools, a few of them, and then also AIS schools. Um, and I also believe my colleague, Katia Turner, is here um, with us as well. So let's go ahead and get started. NTI, we know it is not the new normal. We do not want to point at the new normal. Um, we kind of like to think of it as the, the right now. This is what it's going to look like right now. And even going into the future, when talks of how school is going to look at the beginning of the new school year, we're still going to have to be thinking about that, that right now normal. It's going to change. So we're going to have to make sure that we are flexible so that we can meet the needs of our students. Um, and so not traditional instruction. It's here. Yeah, it looks great. Sounds great on paper. We've got those packets going out. If we don't have access to technology, our students can still have a way to uh, participate in classwork. But when we stop and think about how diverse JCPS is, we have to think about all the student demographics. We have to think about um, our families, what's happening within our families. Um, there are a lot of immediate issues of equity that crop up because we're not in a normal situation. And even if we were in the schoolhouse, it's still we still have to have these conversations about equity. So we're just going to start here. So if you want to take a second in the chat box, what issues of equity or non-traditional instruction spell, what does that mean to you for our students? So if you think about right now, our students are at home and they're either in front of the TV, they're working somewhere collectively. Um, what do you think might be an issue of equity for our students right now. What limitations might our students have at this certain time? We know that, um, you know, Chromebooks are going home to students, but only certain groups of students. Um, so what do you think? What do we have? Do we have any responses? So that's a valid one. We're thinking about not that many devices for students. So if you live in a household that has two or more students, then you're absolutely right. That's an issue, an issue of equity, especially depending on what grade they're on. Um, if you're elementary, you might be working from your choice boards, doing your, you know, your thing on, on the side. You might have a middle schooler or a high schooler that might need to be tied to that device for four, three, four, five hours at a time. So when we're thinking about situations like that, we already know that's not equitable. Um, and so that's something that we're going to have to be thinking about. How can we remove a barrier like that? Um, we have to think about kids who are taking care of other kids. Absolutely. Some parents still have to work. That's the reality. They're getting up every day. They're going to their job to provide for their family. And they're leaving their, their kids in charge of other siblings. Um, because that's just what they have to do right now. They have to live life. They have to make money to, to provide for their family. So that's something that is happening, an extra stressor for our students. Um, absolutely access to devices. We talked about that. Language barriers for our ESL babies. They need um, all the language support they can get. And of course, if they're not in a school, that's going to look vastly different at home. How do we help bridge those, how do we help bridge those um, gaps? Um, absolutely, we've got high school high schoolers who are maybe being that 
sole provider, they may be an essential worker, so they're out there in the field going to work every day. Um, and these are high schoolers, and that's that's how it is. Um, and then also parents who just might struggle with how do I do this? One, how do I how do I get the device? Once you've got it, where do I go? Um, We've had a lot of training here at home about how to make sure we have access to online classes and Google classrooms and even those little things that come about that might be easy as educators to fix. That could be a struggle and a frustration for parents. So we need to make sure that we're given also clear directions on what to do with these devices. So let's go ahead and jump in. Let's get started. Um, our objectives, what are we going to do today? So you participants, you're going to have a deeper understanding of what content integration is. The very first time we did this presentation for AICs and MTSS, um, but we'll talk about that in a second. It was originally a one pager and it had just a really short PowerPoint that went along with that subject, but we'll get more into that in just a second. So content integration, what does that mean? How do I incorporate that in instruction? And then also you guys are going to be are going to get familiar with and use a resource that's going to help you review tier one books and materials. And so I specifically put tier one books and materials in the objective because when we think about content integration, it is about bringing everything together and connecting all of those dots. But we do that within our tier one instruction. We have to make sure that all of our class, like all of our students are seeing that first line of defense, the tier one instruction, um, and then everything else follows. But if it is not in our tier one instruction, then that's something that I want you to also be paying attention to. So let's look a little bit further. This was the one pager that I was talking about just a second ago. So if you look at this document, it can just be used at face value, however it is. Um, you can take a look at content integration, ask yourself that question, and say yes or no. Have I done, have I included, have I incorporated anything like this in any of the materials or things that are going home with my students. If not, then that's something that I would beg you to go back and do some research on and see how we can include that. Um, and so this is where I was saying, if you click on content integration, that link is gonna take you to another PowerPoint. However, it really is just really short. It's just a snippet of information. And this is designed to go deeper with our, um, with our background knowledge. So content integration. So we're pushing teachers, we're pushing PLCs to ask, are you using examples from a variety of cultures and groups? So just that question can be enough to stop you in your tracks and say, what do you mean? What what does that what does that even look like? I haven't, you know, I haven't thought about that. So let's break it down a little bit further. If we go to the next slide, in the words of Whitney, how will I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do? And if you like Whitney as much as I do, the video is linked right there. So if you want to click on it and jam, you can do that. Um, so how will I know? So there are four questions um, based on teaching tolerance um, that lets us kind of dig deeper into the, the books and the materials that we're using. So the very first question here says, do the books or do the books or materials you provide promote a healthy self-concept and or do they explore identity? So it was I was kind of thinking, how can we get that point across to classroom teachers? Um, and I thought the learning targets would be a really great connection so that you all can see what a learning target might look like, but then also how you might mirror that for your classroom and then also find resources. Um, based on that learning target and however you decide to um, teach that skill. So this first learning target says students will express pride, confidence, and healthy self-esteem without denying the value and dignity of other people. So when we think about healthy self-concept, we think about our identity, do we have anything like that in our materials or books that students are reading that kind of highlights that information? And so the second question says, do the books and materials foster inner group understanding? Um, 
these days and times, it is so important that our students understand just how diverse the world is. It's not enough to know that, yes, we are different from other people. It's important to know that there are differences, but that that is absolutely okay. And we also should be sensitive to people who are different than us. So how can you make sure you develop language and knowledge to accurately and respectfully describe how people, including ourselves, how we're both similar to and different from each other and others in their identity groups. So really just having a commonality, thinking about how we can humanize each other. Um, and so this is really going to help us think, how can I make sure that my students are also thinking in this way? All right. Kanita, can you just leave just that part right there? Yeah, perfect. Um, so the third question asks us, do the books and materials raise awareness of prejudice and injustice? Well, an example of a learning target could be students will analyze the harmful impact of bias and injustice on the world historically and today. I think this one to me is so, 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 so important um, because when we think about the world and, and you know what's happening right now, um, it's hard to it's hard to ignore how bias is playing out in the COVID-19 situation. Um, we're looking at reports on the news all the time. We're hearing from experts about how specifically the African-American community has really been impacted by this disease um, and why that's so. We, we know that there are structural issues at play um, we do know that if if you are unaware of any bias that you hold, that's kind of like our front line of um, preparation. If you don't even understand the biases you hold, then that's going to absolutely impact the work that you do. Um, but if you don't recognize that there is injustice in this world, not just now, but historically, um, and then that's something that you are going to have to come to terms with because it is the truth. Um, just that injustice has just, it's been something that has, um, sorry, yes. it's been something that has been at play with our students and, and even each of our lives as well. Um, so how can we make sure that we understand what we don't know so that we can help our students understand um, the world today? So the next question, the very last question says, do the books and materials motivate students to act by highlighting individual and collective struggles against injustice? Um, so we know that students have to understand that they have a responsibility to themselves, but also to others. Um, and so this is where it's really important to think about our students and, and are we building them up to be those change makers? Are we giving them examples of those who have fought the good fight, uh, how they have fought the good fight, the ways that they have tried to dismantle racist systems um, in our society? Are we showing all of these things to our students so they have the opportunity to see what the potential is? So if they notice an injustice in their school, do they have the language to recognize or do they have the wherewithal to recognize what's going on? But then also, do they have the language and um, the heart to stand up to that, to that injustice? And that's what we need to build our students to do. We need to make sure that they are confident and they have the skill and they want to speak up against injustice because if not, if we're not building our students to do that, then we're just going to be having more of the same in the future. So we have to make sure that we are building our students up um, so that they can have these conversations and also be that ally for someone else in need. And so what we're going to move into next, I want to have some time for questions at the end. This is a resource that was in the original content integration um, one pager. But what I've done is kind of expanded it for some important points that I want educators to know. So the link, Reading Diversity Light, is from Teaching Tolerance, and it is a, well, can you, can you click on that real quick? Yes. yes. It is from Teaching Tolerance, and it is a resource that has like 14 or 15 questions um, about the resources and materials that you're using in your classroom. Um, 
And so this is the whole full document. We're not going to go through the whole full document, but what I've done is highlighted some of the ones that I thought were really important that you should really pay attention to. Um, and you can kind of go back and review this at your leisure later. So the link is there for you so you can go um, and prove that at your, at your leisure. But the very cool first question from that document that I want to unpack is actually question number one. And so this question is, what voices does this text include in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, class? All of these things. Do the identities or the experiences of authors, illustrators, characters, speakers, or narrators contribute to students' diverse reading experiences? I know that is a lot of information. However, if you break it down, it's really representation matters. When you look at this book, are we looking for all of these things that might take place? Um, do the identities mirror anything that students are going through? Um, it's important to know the authors of the books that you are choosing. If you have a book written by an, uh, an Asian author um, about a subject maybe maybe something about Africa. I want to know how does that author have some kind of lived experience that connects them to the book that they wrote because then I might think about their authenticity. So it's it, it's important to know who the narrators and the authors of the books you are using are um, because you can unknowingly be perpetuating a stereotype that you, and, and if you don't have that lens, that's something that just could be ongoing. So we need to make sure that we are thinking about all of these things um, when we're choosing materials for, for our students' instruction. Let's look at the next question. So this is question number three. It says, consider the author's attitudes, beliefs, and point of view. Do they promote inclusion and equality? So one example that comes to mind for me is Dr. Seuss. <laughs> We love Dr. Seuss in elementary school, but do we really understand his views um, and how he felt about certain subgroups of people? Um, and if that's something that you don't know about, you probably want to go do some research because these are the those silent and deadly. Excuse me. These are those, those silent and deadly uh, books that might come in. When we're thinking this is a great opportunity to read a fun book to our students, not knowing that we are supporting an author that had racist views. Um, let's see. Let's look at question number five. So consider the gaps and silences. Are certain people or groups left out or given only a silent or insubstantial role? Are certain questions or issues related to the topic omitted? This is why it is so important for our AICs um, and our teachers to work closely together um, to plan instruction for our students. When we think about the gaps and silences, this is something that we haven't thought about before. Um, I have an elementary background, and when I think about how we used to plan, and when I think about the authors that we chose to do units of study with, um, I can now see how maybe that could have done some harm to my students because it, their interests weren't at heart. Um, their faces weren't seen in the books. Um, a lot of elementary books are about bunnies and cute animals, but really we have to take a look at who the students are in our classroom and make sure that we are finding um, our students in the books that we read to them. That is so important. So just make sure that you aren't afraid to broach a topic. We're not omitting something just because we're uncomfortable. We've got to find some way to get comfortable so that we can bring that information to our students. Okay. So question number seven. We've got two more of these and then, and then we're going to move on. So questions to highlight. Consider the historical, social, and cultural context in which the text was written. Is the text relevant now? Y'all, we have so many instances of just old and crotchety materials that we are using. Think about that. Do you want to read this right now? If, the, if this is something that you don't even want to read, do you think your students would? And this is how we say, this is how. A culturally responsive classroom is taking all of these things into consideration. So if you 
are truly teaching in a culturally responsive way, this wouldn't even be an issue for you. You would know the text was relevant to your students because you are matching what is happening with the outside world to the classroom. Um, and so you have to consider the historical social and cultural context, which teachers have not had to do before, because we are we love to do those units of study where we are, you know, we're talking about Kevin Hankins for six weeks. How is how is that helpful? So let's just make sure that we are thinking about relevancy, which we should always be thinking about, because that is also something that's going to help us build a relationship with our students because we're probably going to be talking about things that our students want to know about. So, all right, one more, and then we will move on. So this one has two questions on it. Can you, can you go ahead and add the next one? I felt like these two really went together. So in this document, it talks about does the text connect with the interests and concerns of my students, but also does it relate to and build upon the new knowledge my students bring with them? I have heard so many times over my educational career that our students come as empty vessels and we have to fill them up. We have to pour, 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 which would be great if we didn't think our students didn't know anything. We don't want to think about filling out and filling up an empty pot. We need to worry about adding to whatever they have. Our students come with funds of knowledge. They come with resiliency um, and creativity. But if we're not fostering that, if you're not looking for them, if that's not something that you want to spend time on, then obviously it's, it's something that's not going to be apparent. But you have to make that connection with their interests, and you make those connections by knowing your students. Well, if you're going to read a text, who do you know in the classroom that has a connection with it and why? Um, so we also we always want to be teaching to our students interests that's how we're going to have that engagement piece and keep them connected with us and then does it also build on what i already know so maybe i know something about the coronavirus right now i have some kind of personal experience with it how are you going to make a connection with those students so that that brings their knowledge further we have to make sure that we are um, extending what they know and not assuming that they don't know much okay are there any questions right now that I can take? Well, thank you so much. A lot of great things there. Kim Morales said that she would love to see a unit plan um, taken through your process and then have a PD about that where teachers can see the differences um, before and after. Um, so we do have a PD that I did for a school where um, I don't, it's not taking their specific unit plan through the um, R tool, but it was taking lessons through. Um, a lot of times when we do PDs, it's not uncommon for teachers to not have, you know, just a unit of study at the ready. Um, so we found that it was easier to have a lesson and see how can we find some of these things within the lesson. But that actually... Um, something that we are, well, I think we had already done it kind of with some units that we have planned, um, but we would love to do that in a PLC so we can work with teachers and kind of walk them through that um, and have the conversation while we're there. So that's something that if they want to do that, they can absolutely reach out to us and we can see how to get that on the schedule. Perfect. Thank you. Another question came up and it was directed to my partner, Shade Graves, but I'll I'll throw it out there for you as well. And the person was asking, how have you seen Read Across America celebrated? Um, so I've seen Read Across America celebrate this year specifically. Um, it was kind of a combination. So they did Read Across America and Women, Women's History Month that kind of put those together. Um, and so in that instance, they had also opportunities for read-ins. So different resource teachers and different teachers and people from the community came to schools and did read-ins. Um, and it may have been around a certain theme. It may not have been around Dr. Seuss. It may have been around something else. Um, but really just tying it to another, to something else that's coming right after. And, and in this instance, Women's History Month happened to fall right in line with that. So you could have still celebrated that Read Across America with, you know, those women authors and highlighting um, um, women's, women's Month in that way by 
their read alouds or their read-ins. And other schools also picked up, um, they fed their African-American read-in and to read across America. So when they write for Black History Month, mm-hmm. when they did their African-American uh, read-in for Black History Month, um, they fed it into a, a reading, a, a celebration of uh, diversity in, in books. Um, so the focus wasn't just about um, Dr. Seuss. It was about just again a celebration of reading right so the focus wasn't dr seuss it was kind of just it's read across america this is our theme how can we make sure we incorporate um others into that instead of just dr seuss so if anyone has any other ideas that they did at their school please feel free to list those in the in the comments um if you had a different way to celebrate that read across america um many people i'm sure would love to have those resources and see the different ways that 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 happened um, all right, so we have a few, just a few minutes left. I really only want to just highlight, oh, there's too much. Okay, so one, the JCPS Multicultural Book List is there for you. That is a list that has been curated, curated over this whole year. It is not exhaustive, but it's really extensive. Um, and so there it is parceled out by ethnicity and race. So there are books for many, many different students. Um, in our different demographic. So if you want to look at that, the link is for you there. Um, and it is literally 50 pages of books. And they are, it'll tell you if it's a high school book or elementary. So that's something that you can use and it gives you like a little snippet of what the book is about. So if you need um, any ideas of resources to teach in your classroom, that's a great book list to use. And then I'm gonna move to the next slide because this is so important. Next, one more. One more, Kanina. So this was a visual that this was a visual that um, my team member Ava and Shashari kind of talked about. Ava fleshed it out. So this is what we're thinking about. We have to remember our students. We have to remember that everyone is not in the same place. So it says we are all in the same storm. We are not all in the same boat. And if you'll notice, there's like a fancy cruise liner right there. There's a sailboat. There's a a little rack that looks like it might be hanging off for dear life. When we think about people and where we are in the situation, it may not be affecting you in the same way. You might be in that cruise liner. You might be fine. Everything is is as good as it could be. Or you might be in that rack, that little rack hanging off for dear life. Um, we have to think about things that are happening to our students, mental health, child abuse. I've heard those rates are just going up right now. Um, job loss, illness, housing, and security. So we have all of these things working in the background, and we have all of these things that are on the mind and the forefront of our students. We have to make sure that we're being human to them and giving them work that is meaningful. So if you have any kind of questions, oh, and um, let me see. Is there a reflection tool? So I believe we're going to drop a reflection tool into the chat box. It's just like two short questions. What supports do you feel like you might need for your um, for your work to move forward? And if you would answer those, we would really appreciate it. It's not it's optional. You don't have to do it, but it would just help give us an idea of some things that we can we can be providing for support. Um, is there anything else? I think that's about it. If you want to, do you have your contact information? Uh-huh. Our contact is on the last slide. Okay. And if you contact that person, um, that'll be your, your zone person. So, Kenita, can you put that last slide? Our contact's up here. Yeah. And then you'll know who to contact in the event that you want some support. So, I appreciate your time. It went longer than I wanted to. I'm so, so sorry. Um, but if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and please reach out if you would like any kind of support on the work that you were doing.